service goes on. The words people speak at the end of their lives are often full of meaning. In some cases, they sum up the life that has gone before. In other cases, they're more ironic, more tongue-in-cheek. Apparently, Oscar Wilde, the writer and pusher of the bounds of morality, on his deathbed said, Either this wallpaper goes, or I do. Ned Kelly, the Australian desperado, bush ranger, and convicted killer, at the age of 26, just before his forced death, is reported to have said, such is life, a very short life in his case. <coughs> But perhaps the most unfortunate last words on record are those of General John, John Sedgwick at the Battle of Spotsylvania, part of the American Civil War, back in 1864. And he's supposed to have looked out on the Confederate lines, encouraging his men not to flinch. Why are you dodging like this, he asked. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. He may actually have got that last word out, but very shortly after that, he fell down dead, shot by a sniper's bullet. The words of Jesus that we come to today aren't his very last words. He still has some very important things to say in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. He still has important things to say to his father, in the very next chapter of John. And he has those very, very last words just before he leaves the earth to, to go back to heaven. Go and make disciples of all nations. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. But what we have before us today are Jesus' last words to his disciples before his arrest, his last words to human beings in the upper room. In fact, the end of those words that start all the way back in chapter 13, verse 1, called sometimes the upper room discourse. And as we hope to see, actually at the table, they do end in a great climax. But let's dig into what we could call Jesus' famous last words as we consider his sacrifice for us. The first thing we need to examine is verses 25 to 28. For here, Jesus speaks plainly. And the illustration is a rose, but it's a rose with some words on it. Because a rose itself says certain things. It's a kind of a word picture. It says words. It speaks. And Jesus, a lot of his time, has been using word pictures. <coughs> but here, he speaks plainly. Look at verse 25. Though I have been speaking figuratively, Jesus says, A time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. And as we move through the earlier chapters of John, in the next couple of months, we'll see Jesus speaking to different people. And they won't always understand him right away. He'll say to Nicodemus, the Jewish leader who comes to see him in the dark, you must be born again. And that will throw Nicodemus into confusion. In the next chapter, he'll tell a woman thirsty for true love that he can give her living water. And she'll reply, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now maybe she's poking fun at Jesus, or probably she doesn't really understand what he means. And then in chapter 6, 
Jesus will use the occasion of the feeding of the 5,000 to tell people that he is the bread of life and to encourage them to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Because some of his outer band of disciples take this literally, but Jesus doesn't mean it literally. We're told from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. With someone who has given so much of himself on this rescue mission to the world, it's not surprising that sometimes people don't tune in to what he's saying. And we see that actually in the verses just before where we were reading. If you just look back to verse 16. In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. And he's there and he's using some of these figures of speech. And you can hear the disciples scratching their heads at that in verses 17 and 18. And when we were looking at these verses back in April, I said that Jesus' death and resurrection are really at the center of those little whiles. The first little while takes in Jesus' arrest, his trial, and his death. They won't see him at that time because most of them have run away. And then the second little while speaks of Jesus remaining in the grave, after which joyously they will see him alive, never to die again. And if you remember, we also spoke about a different time scale, with Jesus having left the world, and the disciples who are remaining in the world not seeing him anymore, as they can in the upper room but the Holy Spirit working in their hearts to keep Jesus real to them, to make Jesus even more fresh than ever. Jesus is using deliberately vague language. He knows how much these men can take. He knows their minds better than they do. He doesn't want to give them too many glory details. But he's showing them, even by this talk of the little whiles, he's showing them that he is the master of the future. He knows what's coming. He has a timetable that will not be sidelined. In verse 21, Jesus uses another picture in words. He talks about a woman giving birth, about her agony, and about her joy. It's something the disciples can't fully fathom. What on earth has that got to do with what's happening now? They're so caught up in these events. They're so close to them that they can't make much sense of them. But enough of the disciples are family men to grasp the broad lines of what Jesus is saying about pain and about delight. He wants the disciples to remember he wants them to reflect, to turn these things over in their minds, to dig down into them. He doesn't want them to be overwhelmed by the pain. Rather, in the end, a bit like the exhausted mother, he wants them to rejoice. He wants them to come to that place. Like so much of what Jesus says, if you can penetrate to the bottom of his word pictures, you come up with so much truth. Probably the first word picture we have in the Bible from Jesus' own lips is in Genesis chapter 3, where he speaks to the serpent in Eden about the seed of the woman, that's himself, and the seed of the serpent. And in fact, in just those few short verses in that one word picture, there's so much overarching truth that a commentator on the Psalms has said that that picture lies behind the whole book of Psalms. So this talk about a, a little while, this talk about a woman giving birth, and you can see another time reference in verse 25. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming 
when I will no longer speak that way. Now the NIV says, the time is coming, or a time is coming. The ESV says, the hour is coming. And that's closer to the original. And I think that's better because it suggests a short delay. The most obvious way to understand verse 25 is that Jesus is speaking about the time after his resurrection. A time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language. Those 40 days of instruction between Jesus' resurrection and his return to his Father. The disciples haven't received that instruction yet. Jesus isn't crucified yet, never mind risen. Yet those 40 days, I would suggest, probably form the basis of the scripture writings of Peter and James, that's Jesus' half-brother James, and John, and Jude, another half-brother of Jesus. Writings that constitute much of the rest of the New Testament. Jesus says in verse 25 that he will tell the disciples plainly about his Father. And we've just started studying 1 Peter. And already in 1 Peter chapter 1, there's a lot of teaching about God the Father. About God the Father choosing people. About God the Father giving us new birth through Jesus' resurrection, through his word, about God the Father as an impartial judge. So Jesus is fulfilling what he says here. He's speaking clearly. And what I want you to see in this exchange, it's true of the rest of Jesus' time in the upper room, but in this exchange especially, is how calm Jesus is. And how clear he is in his own mind. His men are confused. But Jesus is far from that. John actually plays down the emotional effects of this last night on Jesus. Whenever John shows us Jesus in Gethsemane, it's a Jesus full of confidence and control. He's striding out to meet his enemies. It's not a Jesus sweating drops of blood as Luke shows us. It's a Jesus who has already resolved to follow his Father's path to the cross. But even John, back in chapter 11, has shown us some spiritual or mental disturbance in Jesus at Lazarus' tomb. It's almost as if Jesus neighs. It's like a wild animal in anger at Lazarus' death. But in chapter 12, John tells us Jesus' heart is troubled as he realizes his hour has come. Or in chapter 13, John describes Jesus as troubled in spirit as he predicts that someone's going to betray him. Today, the spirit of the age would encourage you to let it all out. If Jesus is feeling distress and pressure and even loneliness, then surely he can't bottle that all up. That's not good for him. He needs to let the disciples know what he's feeling. Well, does he? How will that help them? In their highly agitated state, so much of Jesus' behavior is determined by what he knows his men need. When all around him others are losing their heads, he needs to keep a rein on his emotions. He needs not to be so overwhelmed that he can't move on. His strength will convey itself to the others. And that's why he can say in chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. And you see behind all of these words, 
from chapter 13, verse 1, right to the end of chapter 16. The cross looms as a giant elephant in the room. Jesus knows exactly its shape. He knows exactly what lies ahead of him. The disciples don't know. Jesus has spoken of his death often to his disciples, but not when it's almost upon him, because that would be too much for them. He knows what they can take. He's not so petrified by the cross that he can't think beyond it. Instead, if you look again at verse 25, he's talking in verse 25 as if the cross is only a momentary blip. In fact, can you find the cross in verse 25? I think you may be strain your eyes looking. You won't actually see it there. Because he's already talking about another time, another hour coming. Really passing over that most painful period that he will ever go through in his whole life. As if there's nothing really untoward. That hour will end, another hour will come, and that's the resurrection, and Jesus' words will be clearer then. He doesn't tell them all the horrors of the cross, nor does he tell them all the joys of the empty tomb. He knows they can't take that in either, because actually there will be a whole new world then, based on the stupendous fact <coughs> of the truth of his resurrection based on the truth that when you kill a willing and completely innocent victim he doesn't stay dead now Jesus does say more look at verse 26 in that day you will ask in my name I am not saying that I will ask the father on your behalf and he's talking about prayer there He's preparing them for the time when he's not going to be there anymore. But he's not contradicting himself. You look back for a moment to chapter 14, verse 13. Jesus says, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Jesus is promising there to act as a go-between, to ask the Father for what the disciples need. Now he's not saying here in chapter 16 that he won't do that anymore. What he means here turns on the word ask. And in light of what he goes on to say in verse 27, the ask means persuade against his will. Yes, Jesus wants to teach these men more about his Father. Look at verse 27. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. <coughs> the Father doesn't need to be persuaded. He's not against the disciples. He's not against believers today. He's not a mean and stingy God. It's not as if Jesus, by his death, persuades the Father to be kind to us. Rather, his Father takes the initiative. His Father comes looking for us long before we have an interest in him. And then when he stirs us up, when he gives us his Holy Spirit, so that we come to love Jesus, the Father is delighted. It's almost as if he gives us something. He gives us faith in Jesus. He gives us love for Jesus. And then he rewards us for having it. So we're blessed twice over. God is a very holy Father. But he's a very generous Father. The kingdom of God is a world of love. The Father loves the Son more than he loves anyone else. The Son loves those he has come to earth for. 
and those who are loved by the Son love him in return and believe in him. And then when the Father sees us loving his Son and taking a stand for his Son, his heart swells with love for us. You realize that this kind of language is, is overplayed these days, but it is true. We must affirm that God is a God of love. And then Jesus says, verse 28, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. In one sense, this is quite a simple sentence. Jesus is the subject. He's doing the coming. He's doing the leaving. The only other elements in the sentence are the Father and the world. Jesus leads one and enters the other. And then sometime later, he leaves the other and returns to the one. It's a simple sentence, but it's also a stunning sentence. Because it's not a sentence that any one of us could say truthfully. It can only be true of someone from beyond this world. Someone who can enter this world for a reason and then leave this world when he chooses. Does that perhaps put Jesus' death into perspective? Events are not conspiring against Jesus. Events are not running out of control so that Jesus is arrested against his will. Instead, events are fulfilling a prearranged plan so that by Jesus' death, he may be the first of many to go to his Father. He, he is the way. All he says, all he does is the truth. He alone provides the life. <coughs> we must believe in his life and in his death. Notice that all Jesus says here, he says, for the benefit of others. The picture language he uses is to help us think, to realize there's more to Jesus than just what you can see and touch and taste. He's a king who has come down from heaven. He will bring those who love him, those who trust him fully and finally into that heavenly kingdom with his Father. The cross and the resurrection are stepping stones. There's no kingdom without death first. Death as the wages of sin. But death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus must leave to rejoin his Father. And yet, as he says himself in those very, very last words of all, he is with his disciples always. As Augustine said, and it's a bit mysterious what he says, but there's definitely truth in it. When Christ came forth from the Father, he so came into the world as never to leave the Father. And he so left the world and went unto the Father as never to leave the world. <coughs> what was Malcolm saying from Revelation 1 the other Lord's Day evening? The risen and exalted and magnificent Christ walks among the lampstands. In other words, he is to be found among his own people. Are you digging into the words of Jesus. The plain words and the picture laden words, both of them. In all he says, do you hear him thinking of you? Do you see him acting for you? Are you living for him? Praying that he may be more fully formed in you.
Keep your seats and let's just bow for a moment of prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we do thank you for all of Jesus' words, both for his plain words and words that he spoke in parables as well. We pray that by your Spirit, these would be dear words to us, words that we remember when we forget much else. May we seek with the help of your Spirit, to puzzle them out, to apply them to our lives. And Father, we do pray that your word would be a lamp to our feet in a dark and a confusing world, and a light for our path, so that we know where we're going, and so that we are, in truth, following Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen. After the singing of this next psalm, we move into the communion part of our service. And um, just now we're going to sing part of Psalm 22 together. Psalm 22 on page 38. And we're going to sing all that we find on that page, stanzas 1 to 6, to the tune St. Kilda. And Jesus is saying to his group of disciples in the upper room, You have loved me, you have believed in me. But sad to say, many others, many others among the Jews, among the Jewish leaders, did not. And we can see in these words, words written by David, a thousand years before Jesus came, some of the sufferings of Jesus, the depths that he went to, despised, reproached, insulted and we even have a record in, in stanza six of words that people say to jesus not possibly realizing they're speaking scripture but words that, that people said to jesus on the cross he put his trust upon the lord let him deliver him and let him come and set him free since he delights in him and that's exactly what the lord will do not just to to set jesus free but to set those free who love him and who trust in him. Psalm 22 stands as 1 to 6. Let's praise God. My God, oh, why have you forsaken me? Oh, why are you so far from giving help and from my growing pride?
back again to John 16 for a moment. Two verses 29 and 30. Jesus speaks plainly. And secondly, here, the disciples applaud. The disciples applaud. They're happy to hear what Jesus has just said. Look at verse 29. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. They're relieved that Jesus is using simpler language. Maybe too relieved. Maybe it shows their tension, their stress, that this one change from Jesus brings forth so much praise. After all, not everything can be said in words of one syllable. Jesus didn't use picture language for no reason. He used it to sometimes to, to cover over the eyes of some and to open the eyes of others. And to be honest, if you look at verses 25 to 28 that we have just worked our way through, Jesus doesn't say anything earth-shatteringly new there. And yet, they are praising him for now speaking clearly. Wisely, in verse 13, they don't claim to understand all that Jesus has said. Look at what they say. Now we can see that you know all things, and that you do not, not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Well, how can they understand everything that Jesus has said? The cross hasn't taken place yet. They couldn't understand it when he first mentioned it, and they haven't understand, understood it yet. But even so, in this verse, they commit themselves to Jesus' understanding. In much the same way that penitent Peter will in John's very last chapter where he says, Jesus asks him, do you love me more than these? And Peter will say, you know, you know, Lord, that I love you. These men have complete confidence in Jesus. They know that he is no ordinary human being. As this gospel says, as the other gospels say too, time and time again, he has come from God. He is God. Now here, they don't even seem to mind so much his going back to God because they realize it's all part of the whole process. He knows what he's doing. They must trust him. When we talk about those who come to this table, who is this table for? Who is qualified to come to this table? I think we would have to say that a little more is required than what these men seem to understand. Yes, you must know that Jesus is God the Son. You must believe that he has a unique relationship with the Father. But you must also believe what lies behind this passage, what will become plain shortly, what in fact is going to bowl these disciples over, that Jesus is the Good Shepherd who must lay down his perfect life to pay for your sin and who will take up that life again so that you may have eternal life. You must believe that Jesus is your Savior and that the Spirit He gives you is your guide and companion to help you to understand His Word and to live for Him every day. In other words, you must not just applaud Jesus, <coughs> but you must be ready to accompany Jesus, to deny yourself, to take up your cross daily and follow him.
you must have taken steps, as these men had themselves, to join yourself to the company of believers, to submit yourself to the discipline of Christ's church. We always read these terms of membership each time we come to the Lord's table. These questions that each person answers in order to become a, com a communicant member. The first of them is on the vital nature of Scripture, our sole authority for what we believe and for how we live. Do you accept the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the Word of God? and the only infallible rule of faith and practice. Secondly, concentrating on Jesus and all that he is, Redeemer, Saviour of his people, King of the world. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the only Redeemer of men, supreme in church and state, and in dependence on God's grace, do you take him as your Saviour and Lord? And then the third question, not saying that we have everything sorted out, saying that we're on a journey, and that there are certain tests that we can apply to help us on that journey. Do you promise by God's grace to show a teachable and submissive spirit to the teaching of Holy Scripture, as set forth in the testimony of the Reformed Presbyterian Church? of Ireland. And then finally, to do with practical living, do you promise with the help of the Holy Spirit to endeavour to live a life consistent with your profession of faith? And just now we're going to praise God again together and we'll keep our seats. This time to sing part of Psalm 115. <coughs> On page 284, we're going to sing from stanza 6 to the end of the psalm, to the tune Dunlap's Creek, number 78. And these psalms, from Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, are what are called the Hallel Psalms. They either start or end with the words, Praise the Lord, Hallelujah. And these are psalms that would have been sung at the time of Passover. So Jesus would have sung these words on that night, that night in the upper room. And certainly these stanzas are encouraging all of Israel to trust in the Lord and just underlining the blessings, the covenant blessings that are, are for all of God's people, small and great, and children too. The last stanza introduces a, a, a more minor note. The dead who down to silence go, they do not praise the Lord. Jesus is singing here of death. But as far as his death is concerned, his death will not silence him. His death is just a stepping stone to eternal life for all who trust in him. He takes our death so that we might have his life. Psalm 115 stands as 6 to 11. Let's praise God together. <coughs> Trust in the Lord, and help and cheer will see. Yeah, 
Supper. This is God's word. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever <coughs> eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Let's just come to God together in prayer. Let's stand as we pray together. <coughs> Our Father, we have been reading those solemn words which Jesus speaks on that night in the upper room, pointing forward to the significance of what will happen the very next day. We do thank you that this is a covenant, the blood of the new covenant being shed for many. We thank you for your covenant. We thank you that you entered into a covenant with our first parents even on the day they sinned against you. We thank you that we believe that Jesus himself spoke of his own sufferings in fighting against Satan. He would be the one to be punished in our place in order to bring all the blessings of your covenant on our heads. Our Father, we praise you that Jesus turned the Passover meal to focus on to him as your lamb to be sacrificed for us. Only through his body being nailed up, only through his blood being shed, could the covenant be fulfilled. Could your family be opened to sinners like us. Father, your word tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. We praise you that Jesus was prepared to do all that, that he was prepared to be sent away from you to hell on the cross so that we might be welcomed into your family. Our Father, we thank you that Jesus was prepared to be without a father on the cross, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? so that we might have a loving Father in heaven 
for eternity and Jesus as our Saviour and your Spirit as our constant guide. Our Father, we pray that these elements of bread and wine that are at the front of our building today, that these elements will now be set apart from a common use, that they may be a means of grace to us. The signs and the seals of your covenant, the pictures and the promises of our salvation. Our Father, we praise you that Jesus was bound to death for the sins of his people, but that Jesus was raised to new life so that we may have new life, that we may be declared righteous forever. We pray that as we feed on Jesus by faith, that this will do us good spiritually, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Following Jesus' example of giving thanks and setting these pictures of his death apart from common use, we take this bread, we take this cup, and we show them to you, his followers. After Jesus had given thanks, he took the bread and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as our, our normal custom is to show our union in Christ, we'll wait until everyone has been served and then we'll all eat together. Jesus said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup 
is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, following our Lord's example and in obedience to his command, we take this cup waiting to drink together. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And Paul adds, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's come back to John chapter 16 for the last time. We've seen Jesus speaking plainly, the disciples applauding that plainness. And now we come to I think what we can call Jesus' very last words before his arrest. Jesus' very last words before his arrest. In verse 31, Jesus does a little congratulating of his own. You believe at last, Jesus answered. And if you look on to chapter 17, verse 8, where Jesus is praying for these men, you can see that he's affirming their faith. He says, they knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. So there's no sense of irony in what Jesus says here. He's saying, yes, you do really believe that's what I've been working for in your lives. And I'm really pleased to hear that you've got to that stage. So he's generous enough to congratulate them, to speak of the Father's love for them, because they have loved Jesus, because they have believed in him. But in the very next breath, he warns them, verse 32, But a time is coming, and has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And we too must heed that warning, because we're never as far forward as we might think that we are. The little twine that Jesus has spoken about is going to start that very night and it will be a night 
of terror, a night of fear, a night of Satan's power, such as they have never known before. They'll take to their heels. And what Jesus says here is, the last one that you're going to be thinking of is me. But his father will be thinking of him. And his father will be pointing him to the cross. As before, in what Jesus says here in these closing words, <coughs> Jesus can look beyond these traumatic events. These disciples may lose their nerve, but they will not lose their faith. Not because of them, but because of him. Look at verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Jesus is their peace. Even in the maelstrom that they're confronting just at that point. And Jesus is going to make peace by the shedding of his blood to death. That whole verse, that whole last verse, but especially the second half of it, is worth learning by heart. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And Jesus here is confronting the greatest enemies anyone has ever faced. Sin, in all its horror, to a holy God-man. Death, where every sin leads. Not just momentary death, but eternal death, which is hell. And Satan, who wants to finish Jesus off on the cross. And yet because of who he is, and because the Father is with him, Jesus can look at all of these enemies and say, Take heart, I have overcome all of them before a blow has been struck. And that's the victory that his resurrection rubber stamps. Are you having problems today with sin? With death? With Satan? With the fear of hell? Well, trust all you have to Jesus. Because he's beaten them all. He won't save you from trouble. He doesn't say that. He says, in this world you will have trouble. He won't save you from trouble. But he will save you in trouble. And he will bring you to a better day. If you're still on the world side, and I hope that you're not today, if anyone listening here to, to my words, if you're still on the world side, then you do not believe in this Jesus. You will be scattered with no one to pick you up again. But if you do own your sins, your foolishness, your independence, whatever your sins may be, if you own your sins to him, he will replace them with his peace. And then his last words here may be yours because you too will be an overcomer. Take heart, Jesus says, I alone have overcome the world. Let's stand as we talk to God together. <coughs> Our Father, we do thank you for the words of Jesus that we have been studying today. Some words that are clear, some words that are more difficult. We thank you that he is the word become flesh. And that even now, he has a human body. Our Father, we pray that you'd help us to understand not just the words that Jesus spoke, but what led to his coming. The Old Testament promising that a Saviour was on the way. 
and help us also to understand the writings that he inspired, the rest of the New Testament, the teaching that he gave from you about the most important things. Father, help us to understand and to appreciate Jesus' actions on our behalf, especially his death and his rising again. We praise you that you have forgiven the sins of every believer here through that death, through that resurrection. We praise you that today you have lifted up our heads to enjoy communion with Jesus. We pray that you would help us in the weeks that lie ahead to live more by Jesus' words and less by what others say or by our own inclinations and ideas so that we may bring praise and honour to you above all. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close our service by singing Psalm 98a together on page 231. We sing this to the tune Hifredol, number 258. This is a great psalm of praise and victory. It talks about God's great salvation, which is known across the world. And today there are many on every continent trusting in Jesus because of what we've been studying today, because of his death and resurrection. Many who have received his truth and mercy. And we have musical instruments coming in and in stanzas four and five. And those instruments were connected to the sacrifice, to focus on the sacrifice. The final sacrifice has been made and there is a new creation coming, rejoicing in God's salvation, rejoicing even in God's perfect justice. So may we use these words to praise God for Jesus who is our Saviour and our King, Psalm 98a. <laughs>
Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.